So this is Josh Mandel with the fourth in our quick series of new features in Smart V2. And in this one, we're going to focus on asymmetric authentication. So uh, as a quick reminder, in the Smart uh, App Launch Protocol and the Smart Backend Services Protocol, clients are sometimes expected to authenticate to a server to indicate uh, what client is making a particular API call. And uh, as a quick review, the spec lives here at hl7.org slash fire, and the current version is smart v2. And the landing page, this overview page, describes um, a couple of different authorization capabilities. One called smart app launch, and this is really for user-facing apps where a user wants to approve access and delegate uh, their permissions to share those permissions with an app. And the other is called uh, smart backend services, where an app has been pre-configured with certain um, capabilities or permissions that it's going to be able to use directly, even without a user in the loop. And in both of these cases, client authentication comes into play. Uh, a user-facing app might need to authenticate. A backend service always needs to authenticate to a server in order to demonstrate or in order to prove uh, that the app uh, is the app that it claims to be. And in the core specification for Smart V1, we had one method of client authentication, and that was called client secret authentication. And this is just by way of review. Now, the way the client secret authentication works is that when an app first registers with an OAuth server, maybe registers with the EHR, it is given a client ID and it is given a client secret, which is some unguessable string. And anytime it needs to authenticate, it can concatenate the client ID and a colon, and then that secret value, and base64 encode it to get something like this. And this, this is an example showing how you can take that whole thing and stick it in an authorization header to authenticate using this shared secret. Um, this is a very effective technique in the sense that it's easy to implement, and if the secrets are um, generated in a cryptographically secure way, then they should be impossible to guess. They'll have enough entropy. But at the same time, there are some major drawbacks here. And one is if somebody is able to create some kind of um, a man in the middle attack where they can observe this authentication um, being sent in an authorization header here, then just observing this once means that they now know the client secret and they could impersonate that client in future interactions. So that's one real challenge to this kind of method. The other challenge is if this app needs to register with lots of different EHRs, uh, maybe it's registered with hundreds of different clinical provider systems, well, it might need hundreds of different secrets or thousands of different secrets because, of course, the app would not want one healthcare provider to know its secret uh, that it uses for communicating with another healthcare provider. Um, you want your secret to be known only between the app and uh, the entity that the app is authenticating to. Otherwise, anybody else who knows the secret could pretend to be the app. And so managing or juggling or balancing that set of thousands of secrets can be very challenging. And then if uh, a secret gets compromised, uh, the process of getting a new one and making sure that the old one is invalidated, uh, that was also um, a real world potential operational challenge. So in Smart V2, we've introduced a second mode of client authentication, which is asymmetric authentication using public keys. Uh, and the idea here is that at registration time, instead of receiving a symmetrically shared secret from the server, instead what happens is the app tells the server, here is my public key, or here is a document where my latest public keys can always be found. So at registration time, the client communicates to the server some information about its own public key material. And then at authentication time, instead of sending a secret over the wire, the client constructs a signed assertion um, and sends that assertion to the server. Um, so let's just take a quick look um, at how this appears. First of all, in the smart server's capability, uh, smart configuration document. So this is how a server can advertise that it supports asymmetric authentication. There's a few properties that need to be included in that well-known slash smart configuration JSON file. Um, so one of them is this idea of token endpoint authentication methods. And so seeing private key JWT or JSON web token here is the first indication that the server supports some flavor of asymmetric authentication. And then the next important piece is a, a description of which 
signature algorithms the server supports. And we call out a couple here. Um, a server needs to support at least one of these two methods and can also support other signature schemes as well. So this is uh, an RS384 or ES384. And these are two different um, signature schemes using either RSA keys um, or elliptic curve based keys. And seeing these properties in a configuration file tells a client, this is a server that is, uh, is willing to accept asymmetric authentication from clients. So assuming your server can do that, at registration time, a client is going to somehow communicate its public keys. And what we strongly prefer is that rather than just sending over those keys in a one-time payload to say, here's my public keys, we strongly prefer if the client can register a URL to what's called a JSON web key set. And that's a document that lives on the, on the web and can be updated by the client from time to time when it needs to rotate its keys. And so what this provides us is a way for clients to manage their own keys over time. If they know that a key has been compromised or maybe they're just adhering to a pre-specified key rotation schedule, they can mint new keys and they can update their JSON web key set document and have the URL, uh, have the URL of that registered with the EHR. And that way the EHR can always keep up to date with the client's latest keys. Um, that said, not all clients maintain any kind of web presence and not all EHRs um, are necessarily going to support resolving these um, at runtime, although um, EHRs that comply with uh, this spec and want to be certified to the EHR um, certification criteria from ONC uh, will, will have support for this capability here. Uh, but it's also possible that a client might just want to directly register a JSON web key set to say, here's one or two public keys, and then maybe go back to a registration portal um, manually when the client needs to rotate its keys. Either way, these are a couple of different methods, but at the end of this step, the client has registered its keys so the EHR is aware of its public keys. And then at runtime, the client can authenticate by constructing a cryptographic token, a JSON web token, that includes a few particular pieces of data or claims inside of it. And I won't go into a ton of detail, but basically the client is going to include its own client ID um, in these two fields, issuer and subject. It's going to include the EHR authorization server's uh, token URL. That's the audience of this token, meaning I'm creating this token specifically to be received by this um, token API endpoint. Um, so the token identifies where it's meant to be used. And an expiration date, which has to be short-lived. It can't be more than five minutes in the future. Um, so this is a way of creating these tokens. So they're effectively intended for one-time use and they have a unique token identifier as well. So the EHR can easily recognize whether it see, has seen the same token more than once within this five minute window. Um, once the client generates this kind of token, it passes it to the server as part of an access token request um, using two standardized parameters on that token request. Uh, the assertion itself, so that signed JSON web token, goes into a property called client assertion. And then the assertion type, which is a fixed value that looks like this, is what tells the server, hey, you can expect to find uh, one of these compatible JSON web tokens over here in the assertion field. And simply by including those two values in uh, the request, the client can authenticate it itself to the server. Uh, there are some more details and constraints in terms of how a server processes these requests um, and looks up information about the client in their existing data store. And there are some examples if you want to go into greater detail about exactly how these JSON web tokens um, are generated. And we have a GitHub repository with the underlying keys, uh, including private keys. So if you want, you can reproduce these examples uh, exactly. Um, so you can try that out and see where these values come from. But that's a quick introduction to asymmetric authentication. Uh, and you can see that it solves these two problems. One is key rotation. And the second is um, an eavesdropper who sees one of these tokens over the wire won't be able to authenticate as this client in the future because this assertion is a one-time use assertion and it doesn't convey any private key material. So just knowing this is not gonna be enough for me to impersonate you in the future. Um, so that's the quick overview. Hope that's been a useful introduction to asymmetric authentication. And that concludes our series of uh, brief looks at new Smart V2 features. If there's other features or other questions that you've got about Smart V2, uh, please ask me a question in the comments or join the chat.fire.org site and we'll be happy to dig in over there. All right, take care.